Welcome to another episode of the Wholesale Elite Podcast. I am Aisham Hipshire, and I'm here with my main man, my side dude, Mr. Tanner Santucci. What's up, brother? Let's get it going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Guys, woo! I uh, if you're if you're looking at the screen, you know who's here. If you're not, just just strap in. Just just hang on a second, because I I kind of want to fill you guys in a little bit. Um, look, so we started this podcast not too long ago for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, we wanted to mainly really dive into the mindset of very successful um, wholesalers, right? More specifically, wholesalers in the real estate investment world. And so, you know, we're here, right? We're getting started. But one of the people that I can promise you that I was so looking forward to having on the other side of this camera, uh, or two of the people, excuse me, are here in front of us right now. Uh, they, they're extremely, extremely uh, well-loved in the community that we're in. They're well-known amongst the wholesaling community. Um, they're crushing it. They're all over the, the nation and their markets. And they're just a power couple. And so guys, without any further ado, I want to jump right into this and welcome Paul and Michelle. What's up, guys? Hello. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for having us, guys. Oh my gosh. Ooh. The honor is ours. The honor is ours. I, uh, I, I'm i so grateful uh, to, to have you guys on here. And I can't wait to really dive in. You know, you guys have shared your story, um, you know, a lot of places with a lot of people. And I, I don't want us to do that again. You know, I don't want us to have a repeat of that. I kind of want to go in a little bit deeper and okay. I want to ask some questions. I want to know what makes Michelle, Michelle. I want to know what, what makes Paul, Paul, you know, what, what, what happened? What, you know, what, so usually, you know, there, there's always some, you know, some situation in, in someone's family life or something like that, that wires them to go out and be better than, you know, maybe their parents or prove something to themselves or to someone else. And so I kind of want to peel the layers back. And I'd love to, to start by just asking you guys kind of what's your origin story? You know, where, where are you from? What was family life like at the very beginning before we even get into real estate? So I know that's kind of vague, but just give us a little bit of your origin stories and, you know, uh, where you're from siblings, family life, that kind of stuff. And we'll just spend a few minutes there before we grow on. Awesome. Yeah, I, got it. I got it. Okay. So my name is Michelle. I was born and raised in the Bronx, Bronx, New York. All day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my family is from Dominican Republic. They came all the way from the Dominican Republic and when they were teenagers um, and they were trying to live the American dream. My mom went to college. She worked at Burger King. She worked at Bombini, which is a store in the Bronx. And she was just trying her best to live the American dream. And so when she had me, her biggest goal was I want to have my first child in America. So she literally stayed in America just so she can have her first child. So I am wow. the first born American child in my family. And I was born and raised in the Bronx. She was in college when she was having me. So she did have me really young. She was like 22. Um, and so she had to drop out of college and have me and, you know, growing up, I grew up in the Bronx, you know, we were on welfare and lived in section eight housing. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, but we still had a pretty awesome childhood, you know, like living in a one bedroom apartment next to the basement. So I had friends like, you know, rats and roaches just come in and, you know be our friends. And then we were friends with all our neighbors, you know, in the first floor. And so the hallway was always super big and we would play like suicide ball and we would play double dutch and jump rope and, you know, red light, green light, one, two, three. And I was always very theatrical and loved music. So me, my neighbors, my little sister, she's three years younger than me and my cousins, we would, you know, make up dances to like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And my mom had her big ass video camera and like, yes. us, you know, <laughs> I just I had big dreams of being a singer and a dancer. So my mom put us in ballet class, tap class, music class, modeling, modeling class, which is a big thing in like Dominican culture is like you got to go to modeling class. You got to go to etiquette school. And really? Yeah, it's like I, I always tease pause like you cannot slurp in uh in, when we're having dinner. That's not how you pick in. Like come on, fork over here, knife over here, and you do your thing. 
Um, so we did all that. And so, you know, my mom, of course, just like any like um, Hispanic family and Hispanic culture coming from nothing, you know, she always tried to make it through her children, through us. And so that's why she put us like in ballet class. Oh, maybe you could be a really famous ballet dancer and like, you know, be so big and create wealth for the family and save us and get us out of poverty, you know? Mm. And so ballet didn't happen. Then, oh, maybe you could be a really good tap dancer and, and make it on Broadway. And that didn't happen. And then I started getting really into singing and instruments. And so um, I was a, I was a lead singer of a band and then I was playing piano and then I got really good at the trumpet and then I was in a band for a long time and we were like tour and we sang in like Yankee Stadium, the Botanical Gardens. And we we would come in and do like radio shows. And then were you a teenager at the time? How old were you? Teenager. I was like 12. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was it was like from 10 to like 16 was when I stopped. OK, um, so, you know, we were really like and then we like uh, recorded a music label and like. All, like all the things. Okay. And so this was my mom's way of like seeing what talents I had and kind of use that to save the family really. Cause we were in poverty. Um, and so I really had a passion for music and instruments. And I also believe that that was going to be the way that I was going to save my family from poverty because I saw how we grew up. You know, we had food stamps. That's how we bought our foods. I literally didn't know that you could buy food with cash until I was in high school and I saw my friends paying cash for oh, like wow. groceries because I always just remember that white EBT card. <laughs> that's all I wow. remember. And like, that's all I saw my mom pay with. And so when I went to high school and saw people paying food with cash i'm like what's that like how do you, <laughs> you know? I, know, I get some of that i don't get some of that right so so yeah so my you know we were i just remember just us being poor but one thing my mom was very entrepreneurial so even though oh, we okay. did live on government assistance you know um my mom never wanted to depend on that um even though she is like she wanted to depend on it because it's like security you know because the check will come in every month and they paid for your food right but it was so little to be able to pay, to like feed two kids, you know? Right. Um, and so my mom had a love and a passion for children. And so because she was on welfare and didn't really have a job, she would pick us up from school. And then she would see a lot of my friends didn't have their parents pick them up from school. So they would stay with the teachers and stuff like that. So she volunteered to like bring kids that, didn't have parents to pick them up because they were still working and she would bring them over to our house. She would call the moms because the teacher gave them the number and was like, Hey, your daughter could stay at my house. And then eventually she started charging, you know, um, these families and they, she would charge like $20, $30. But then eventually we would have 10 kids <laughs> the- <laughs> and we would have 10 kids in the house. She started a whole business of like picking up kids from school having them stay in our house. And of course my sister and I are very theatrical. So we started making music with them, dancing with them, coloring, teaching them Spanish. And my mom literally created a side hustle off of like a baby babysitting company and, and a daycare. Wow. And so that extra money, she would take us to Florida and she would take us to Disney world. And we always had nice clothes. And I always saw my mom like hustle for us. So like, mm. even though we were, you know, on welfare and things like that, like there was never not food on the table because my mom would do whatever she had to do to make sure there was food. You know, she always made sure that we had the, you know, uniforms ready. We had nice little Walmart notebooks for school and like book bags and everything. And so I feel like that's where I got my entrepreneurial bug from. So that's basically what it, what it was like growing up in the Bronx. And then I was in public school for a long time. That's where I learned how to fight. Where I learned how to curse people. <laughs> That's where I got my uh, masculine energy from. Was public school and growing up in the Bronx. And Wait a minute, so- I'm from public school and all that stuff. I don't have any of that. I think that's that DR blood <laughs> running through your veins. <laughs> Wait, are you Dominican too? No, I'm not. Okay. Unfortunately, you, you Dominican vibes though. Like, okay. Well, I've heard, I have heard uh, yeah. that, that, that there is the potential for Dominican or Puerto Rican, but I don't you know. Maybe I need to... We could literally right. be siblings. 
Like, okay, we do look alike. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's where I literally got my masculine energy from was like learning how to fight in public school was always getting in fights because I don't know, I guess I was such a feminist that like guys would like push me and think that I wouldn't push them back. I'll push them, I'll punch them, I'll do whatever I got to do. And my mom always said like, don't ever let anybody like hurt you. Mm. So I was also a really good student in school. Like I always had good grades. And whenever I learned the subject, I became a master at it. And my mom always taught us that school is the way to become successful. And so when I was getting ready to go to high school, my plan was to go to a music school because you guys, as I was sharing, music was my passion. And that's the route that I thought was going to get my family out of poverty. Right. But then I had an amazing guidance counselor that was like, girl, you have such amazing grades. You're an amazing student. Like you will not do well in a public high school. I think that you should go to a Catholic school. And I was like, girl, hell no. <laughs> what is that? Um, especially because like uh, I had to pay money to go to private school. I had to wear a uniform. And here's the kicker. It was all girls private school. So huh. I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> so, but, you know, I had to share it with my mom. And my mom was like, well, if if there's any way you can get a scholarship, like we can go for it. So long story short, I did qualify for a scholarship that instead of my mom paying $400 a month for private school, we were only paying $80 a month for the private school. And it was such an amazing deal. And I had a sponsor who was a very successful lawyer pay the other three 20. Wow. And I had that scholarship for four years. I was in private school. I had the best private school education. It was all girls school. I really felt like I, I got even more of, like that, um, that drive of being a woman in America and, and being a successful woman in America from going to an all girls Catholic school. And, and, and all throughout uh, high school, I continued to do musicals. I, I continued to do music and just become a really good student. I learned French. I really dove into my spirituality. And that's also where I learned about network marketing, which we'll get into that later. But um, but yeah, that was me growing up is is it was just I came from nothing. And then I I, I used that journey to make my life into something. And that was my drive was to get my family out of poverty, get myself out of po poverty and reprogram my brain from poor mindset into the wealth mindset that I have today. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. I, so Michelle, I, I heard a little bit of your story, you know, through previous interviews, but I don't know a lot about you, Paul, man. I am dying I know. to know. And I feel like people think that I'm the star. No, Paul is the real star here. Well, that's you know, what's crazy. funny is when, when Michelle was talking about how she would beat up on the other boys, that's when Paul's arm came off the chair. He had, <laughs> he, he had uh, for those that can't see, Paul had his arm around Michelle, and then as soon as she started talking about that, the arm came down, and he's like, uh, yeah, uh, well, maybe. She's been working out. She's strong. Right? Yeah. I've been saying that. I could deadlift like 210. Don't, don't mess with me. I, always, I see her muscles, and I go, who are you trying to beat up? Right? <laughs> She goes, everybody. <laughs> Every <laughs> yeah. You want to catch these hands too? Yeah. Man, Paul, let us know, bro. Like, what, what, what is your story? I'm so fascinated. Well, I have a track, huh? very different story than yes, Michelle. Yes, you do. <clears throat> I grew up also in New York until I was 10. Um, my in brother the city? I, yep, New York City in Manhattan. Okay. Um, I have an older brother, about two years older. Um, and, uh, both my parents worked, so we had a babysitter. Um, I mean, it was great. We just, at a certain age, you can't have two boys sharing a room <laughs> and we were becoming teenagers and sharing bunk beds. So my parents were looking for a bigger place and decided to move out into the suburbs. So we moved about 45 minutes out of the city into Connecticut, um, Fairfield County. So it's, it's not far away. Um, my dad had to commute. He actually worked at the world trade center. So he was commuting an hour and a half each each way um, while they were there. And then crazily enough, after 9-11, he started his office moved to like 10 minutes away. Um, and then he was a very successful uh, lawyer working in uh, financial, uh, like mutual funds, stuff like that. And then my mother, she is a social worker. She did it for over 40 years, helping cancer patients um, basically overcome their treatments, make sure they're qualifying for all the right programs. They're getting the right treatments, you know, basically fighting for their behalf. 
uh, cause she's not really a rule follower and that's the kind of person you need. Uh, right. so, uh, you know, I learned from my dad, the importance of providing and creating great income. And then I learned the importance of my mom of, you know, caring for people Absolutely. and, uh, that partnership allowed her to not really worry about money and just focus on the patients. Uh, if you actually look it up, there was a, she got on the news and it, this article like went all over the world because she started a program, uh, a laughter program to help people think more positively about cancer um, and like use laughter to cure cancer. So once a month, they would hold these programs where they would tell really inappropriate jokes uh, and make it kind of, I mean, if it was still going, Jamil would love this. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah, I'm Bro. sure. Uh, but I never went. My brother went and he said it was pretty crazy. Uh, but it's this way to help people think more positively about cancer and overcome it. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, they were both working all the time. So my dad had to commute. So he's leaving, you know, he was leaving the house before the sun was up and he was getting that back out as the sun was going down. Mm. Um, so I didn't see him very much for a lot of that time. Uh, and then my mom had to commute about 30 minutes into the Bronx, uh, uh, to work at a hospital or a cancer center. So for the most part, until we were teenagers and could work out, watch ourselves, uh, we were raised by our babysitter who was, uh, from the Caribbean, which is funnily later in my story, I ended up falling in love with the Caribbean, I'm sure because of her. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, it was cool. It's just, you know, that anybody who's grown up with parents who work a lot, you're raised by, you know, your nanny or your babysitter, not really by your parents, mm. um, which has its pros and cons. You know, they were always loving and supportive of anything that we wanted to do. Uh, I just, you know, I wish that I could have spent more time with them. That's all. Mm. Um, and then as we were teenagers, me and my brother struggled a lot. Uh, we moved out to Connecticut um, and we didn't have much luck in making new friends. Um, both of us, you know, really struggled with that. We were in an area with a lot of wealthy kids. Uh, we weren't necessarily that wealthy compared to all those around us. Um, and a lot of these kids were at country clubs and had been raised and privileged their whole life, known each other since kindergarten. Uh, and they were really not nice and not accepting of new people. Mm. And so both of us really, really struggled. Um, I, you know, just focused on school um, and, you know, lots of movies and video games and ways to distract myself, uh, sports, stuff like that. My brother, he really struggled with that. He had a lot of anger issues. Um, so, you know, it was, it was difficult because we both were having issues, uh, and my parents weren't really there to deal with it. You know, we would, we would get home from work and my, my brother would be fighting constantly and trying to call my parents to solve it. And they're not there. So, you know, it wasn't the easiest in terms of that sense. Financially, we were blessed. Uh, it was just emotionally, we weren't really given what we were needed, uh, which is not their fault. It just was the situation. Um, so me and my brother fought a lot. And uh, I really got <clears throat> passionate about science. I got accepted in high school into this program uh, that was really revolutionary at the time. It was a three-year program where we choose a science project and study it for all three years of high school, kind of like a, like a high school version of a PhD kind of thing. Oh, wow. And, uh, I studied like uh, finding new and low cost ways to get into outer space. Um, and so this was before uh, SpaceX and all that stuff. Was was Elon would be proud. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I got really involved in that. I, I pursued some really cool ideas. I got to go to different conferences. I got to go to Japan and, Canada and meet all these top scientists. And I thought that I was going to be an engineer and that would be my path because uh, I loved math. I loved science. Um, and then I ended up realizing when I did go to college that uh, that just wasn't my thing. I, I enjoy people a lot more than I do just sitting and reading books and doing tests mm -hmm. all day. Um, so uh, I actually published an article that ended up going in a book. So when I was in high school, I became like a published author um which Rock was cool star. um i also was a very unhappy kid i had no confidence in myself uh, i put on a lot of weight because eating became my solution to deal with all that stuff mm. um and so it made it even more difficult to make new friends uh so again i just kind of hung around with not good kids who took advantage of me um you know the you know I, I was just looking for people to accept me and unfortunately, the only ones who would do that would use me. Mm -hmm. And so like someone I thought was my one of my good friends, 
uh, ended up uh, like stealing a whole bunch of stuff from my house. And my parents had to call the police on him. Is this whole crazy oh. situation. Um, and then it wasn't until um, like the middle of high school that I finally found kids that just were cool people who accepted me for who I was. I started playing ultimate Frisbee, um, which is like the white people version of football, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, you're not wrong. Uh, football, <laughs> football without the pads. Um, and uh, super fun, though. Uh, and so actually we were on, we created a high school team. I was on that. I was never really in great shape, but I just enjoyed doing it. And then I ended up playing in college as well, which was really fun. Um, and uh, me and my brother, you know, both of us, we were never really good at making friends. And these weren't high quality people. So it wasn't fully our fault. These are very superficial people, a lot of them. And so uh, we threw parties in our house and we threw like the best parties in this, like in the school. Um, and my parents figured, you know, I'd rather them party in our basement than be out in the streets. So, nice. Uh, we'd throw parties in our basement. We'd bring like a couple people in the front door and then we'd sneak over the fence, like 30 more people and a ton of alcohol and they wouldn't really know about it. Um, <laughs> so it was fun because everyone's like, yo, everyone knew me because I was throwing these parties, but I would spend the whole time just making sure that, you know, that I was cleaning up the messes and dealing with everybody. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course I fell in that trap of thinking that getting drunk all the time would solve my issues. And that's why I ended up going to one of the biggest party schools in the country, University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, where, uh, you know, basically they drink like a religion. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's why today we don't really drink much because I feel like I drink. You so drink much. enough. Like, just, hey, I'm you are that. explaining my college experience. So. <laughs> I, I mean, there was partying and then there was yeah. school eventually if I had time. <laughs> um, and so I really struggled in school as well in college because I just didn't try. Um, anytime I applied myself, I did well. I just never really applied myself. Sure. And same thing. That's also when I got involved in network marketing. So I thought I was going to be rich and free at 21 years old. <laughs> and so I figured I don't need these school. I don't need my professors. I'm going to make more money than them. So I don't care what they have to say. Um, and, you know, it was really irresponsible. You know, my parents yeah. are paying for school and I was not even going to class a lot of the times. And it took me like six years to graduate because I just was doing a lot of stupid things yeah. um, that, you know, I don't blame network marketing for all that, but it was just the conduit to allow me to think that it was okay. Right. Sure. Uh, sure. You know what I mean? To, to do these things that just weren't cool to think, Oh, I'm, I'm not going to have a job, so I don't need to listen to you. And you know, my way to skate, to escape and start over. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that's a lot of my experience. Yeah. That's perfect, man. I mean, and thank, thank you for sharing that because it, it gives us uh, or it gives me and the listeners a good understanding, uh, especially if it's a relatable story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think a lot of us will we'll hear stories from other people and we'll say, good for them. You know, but that wasn't my story or yeah, of course they were successful. You know, they had this, you know, challenge or they had this opportunity, but that wasn't my story. That was me for the longest time. You know, I yeah. was jealous of people that grew up poor. I was jealous of immigrants. I was jealous of kids who had money because I always thought that that was the reason why they were, you know, the poor yeah. people, they were tired of being poor. You know, I wasn't poor, you know, the the, the rich people, they had, you know, mommy and daddy who could support them and pay for connections and network and do all this stuff. And I didn't have that, you know, what was me? And so hearing these origin stories to me is it's, it's priceless because uh, especially someone, you know, who's kind of in the middle, you know, the, we, we weren't dirt poor. Sounds like you guys weren't either, Paul, uh, nor were we wealthy, you know, my family. And so we are kind of that middle ground. I think there's a lot of people that are in that area that feel like, shit, I don't have this thing pushing me or pulling me to get me to success. Right. So, you know, what do I need? So I'm, you know, I'm quite sure that ultimately it's going to come down to the why and we'll get there eventually. Um, but let's talk network marketing. So at this point, you guys are you guys are, are you know, you, you've gone through the, the gauntlet of adolescence and everything else. And now, you know, you're ready for the world. You yeah. probably, you know, you've probably had a few jobs between now and then. And then you learn about this thing called network marketing. And for any of the listeners or viewers uh, that aren't familiar, network marketing, you know, another phrase for it, although it's a more negative phrase, but it's, uh, you know, MLM. Um, um, I don't know. What else do they call network marketing? 
scam. Pyramid scheme. <laughs> pyramid pyramid scheme. scheme. Yeah. yeah. So there's, you know, there's legitimate network marketing companies. Yeah. There's, there's shit network marketing companies. There's legitimate people and leaders. There's crappy leaders, just like in any other industry. Um, however, network marketing is a bit of a challenging one because there's the promise and then there's the, the actual price yes. you know? and, and they're very yes. different. You're, you're promised one thing. And then when you get in and you, you get up to the level to where you're ready, you know, then, then, you know, the rug kind of gets pulled out from underneath you. So okay. let's transition for any of our recovering network marketers out there that are <laughs> listening and watching, you know, uh, Michelle, can you, can you give them a little hope? Tell them your story, how you got in, you know, oh, and maybe, okay. maybe, you know, maybe okay. a little bit of what happened and, and then we'll transition over to real estate. Yeah. I just yeah. want to share something quickly about that. Um, I know we won't be able to get all the way in. Yeah. We did a two hour podcast. Yeah, we can do part two. It's all good. <laughs> we also have a two hour podcast. Uh, it's um, called Life After MLM. You can listen to the full story there. Yes. <laughs> I'll link it up. Like yeah. Life After MLM. Um, it's something just to share about network marketing is like there's two sides because People either don't know what it is, they love it, or they hate it. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. it's, you're fitting in one of those three. And I think that there's like kind of like two sides to it. Like, can you make a lot of money in it? Yes. Right. Is there value? Like, are you going to learn skills like public speaking, goal setting, dream building, organization, you know, communication meant like, yes, there's, there's that there. Absolutely. Are there a lot of shitty people? Yes. And is there a lot of scams out there? Yes. So like, there's all these points of view. I think the key to looking at it, though, and understanding is that very few people actually have success, mm, right? Sure. So uh, they, they target people who are most susceptible. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're broke people. I mean, some people do target that, but it's people who have a void in their life, mm -hmm. right? That are looking for acceptance or love or purpose, right? And they're kind of a little lost. And that's when they grab you. And the issue is nine of those 10 people are going to get, they're going to need that, right? Because it fills the void, but they're mm -hmm. not going to make any money. Mm -hmm. right. So a lot of these people end up losing money, but then they can't leave, right? Because so they, they need that. Correct. And then the one that does make money is making money off of training all those people who are losing money, Yeah. right? So those people who say, oh man, I, I'm sorry you went through that, but we've had a great experience with network marketing. It's probably because you've not been in long enough or you haven't had enough success to see what's really going on. Right. Very true. Right? I just had to share that so yeah. people get it, but go ahead. And so let's talk about like what our voids were and why we were so attracted to network marketing. You know, for me, I was in high school um, and I was into the music scene pretty heavily. I was in the, I was in the band and I was looking into um, musical theater school and like going into college and stuff like that. So when I was a senior in high school, which is when I saw the um, multi-level marketing plan for Amway and BWW, for those of you guys that may be listening to it, maybe you're in it, maybe you're looking at it, that was the company that I was into. Um, the void for me was I got to a point in my life where I lost a lot of friends, so I didn't have a lot of friends. I was also had no idea what college I wanted to go to. So I was never the type of person I was like, I have a dream college and like, this is it. Never, never had that. Um, and so I also went to an all girls private school where they were super strict. It was either you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, go into the army or become a nun, Pick one, you know, Pick and so none of that interests me. And so when I told my guidance counselor in high school, like, you know, I really want to be like, um, in, in music. Like I want to either be on Broadway or I want to write music or I want to be this. And she was like, but what else do you like? I was like, well, I'd love to help people. Like I'm a very great people person. She was like, well, maybe you could be a musical therapist. And I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> therapist. Like, like right? you're going to tell me about your problems and I'm going to write a song about it. Like right. <laughs> we're good. So I, the void was, I had no friends because all my friends, like, you know, Things happen in high school, right? I had a lot of drama and all that stuff. And then I also had no idea where I was going in life because I had no college I was into. Um, my musical therapist major was non-existent in some <laughs> colleges, okay? And so when a good friend of mine who I grew up with, and she, we were also in the same high school, she was number three out of like 200 students because they rank you in private school. She was super smart. She invites me to a meeting to see the marketing plan for Amway. 
And they paint you this promise that for me as a girl growing up in the Bronx and living on welfare and having no idea where I was going to go in life and all that stuff. And she's showing me about, you know, helping six people shop from this company and they get paid to shop and then you get paid to shop and then they know their people and then their team grows and that team grows. And then you make $500,000 in the next two to five years. I'm like, where do I sign? Right. Where right. Do I sign? <laughs> And so that was my void. No friends, not knowing where I was going in life, found someone who was in life and was going to um, to be in life where I wanted to be. And then she also connected me to a ton of people who were going, who were in life where I wanted to be. So I was networking with like helicopter pilots, lawyers and doctors who were also in Amway building this business. So here I am, 17 years old, have no idea where I'm going in life. But I'm in rooms with lawyers and doctors and other business people. And I'm the youngest one in the room. And I'm already thinking like, yo, by the time I'm 25, I'm going to be a multimillionaire and da, 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 da. And that's how they got me. And I signed up and I was in it for 10 years. And the reason why we were in it for so long, like Paul talked about, is because of the work ethic that I had based on my family, right? My, how, what I learned from my mom. My dad is also in my life. I know I don't really talk too much about him, but he is in my life. We just don't have a really good relationship. But my dad has been working for the same company for 25, 30 years. He's never missed a day. I mean, homeboy works Thanksgiving, Christmas. So that work ethic that I saw from my family translated into network marketing. I hit one of the highest ranks in 11 months. By the time that I was 19, I was making like 40 grand. I had a team of 60 people. I had to rent coach buses to bring my team to conferences and events. Um, I even started a meeting in New York City right in front of Madison Square Garden where I had hundreds of people getting recruited to be on my team. I used to pay Paul to come speak on my team because he was like the best speaker. Um, I used to public speak and show marketing plans almost every single week in front of hundreds of people. And then eventually we got so big, they would come have us speak in front of conferences in front of 20,000 people. And then we just, this is where we learned how to, how to dream build. We've been doing vision boards since we were 17 years old. We know how to build teams. We know how to talk to people. We know how to public speak. We know how to present ourselves. We know how to network right. and we know how to set goals. We know how to game plan. We know how to create systems and processes. And for 10 years, I worked my way up to the top of the scale. And then what I saw behind the curtain when I started to become a big leader. And then when I started to hang around other leaders within the company, we were freaked out of what we saw. <laughs> freaked out. You know, when they say like, peel the curtain back and see what's behind there. Oh yeah. So we were there. We were there. I mean, the the millionaires that we used to hung, hang out with in multi-level marketing, I mean, these are people that built schools for their kids, homeschooled their kids. If they wanted to learn about China, they would fly to China and live there for a month and have their kids learn about China. If they wanted their kids to learn about uh, how to speak Spanish, they would live in Mexico for a year and speak Spanish. Like these are people that like if they wanted to travel with their kid and their and their teacher said no, they literally shut down the school and buy a whole new school that their kids can go to. Like these are the people that we hung out with. And so you see this and you listen to their audios and you see them on stage and they're in their glittery dresses and it's phenomenal. But when Paul and I would go to like what they call night owls and like masterminds and we saw what was behind the curtain, that is when the problem began. And we mm -hmm. saw people getting, you know, us getting manipulated and getting threatened Whenever we wanted to focus on our health, we got threatened to like get kicked out of the team. When I started to want to do things differently, they took me off my own speaking schedule. When, whenever Paul and I, we had, we, we've known each other for 10 years. When Paul and I started showing interest in each other, like six, seven years ago, and my, my, my uh, ex mentor at the time found out he excommunicated us and we couldn't talk for six, seven years. Were you guys was, on separate teams? We were on separate teams. Yeah. Got you. So things like that happen, you know, um, I mean, there was so many other things, but that's really w how we got big into network marketing. What our, our old life just continued to, you know, benefit us, our work ethics. And so, of course, we grew a successful network marketing company. But then when as we started getting big and started to gain influence, they, they got us, you know, and, and they really controlled and manipulated our families, our life our everything. We weren't able to travel because we had to focus on our business. 
We couldn't buy um, new things without checking with our mentors. We couldn't date without checking with our mentors. Some people, they can't even have kids until they reach a certain rank. You know, these were the mm. things that we were in. And then 10 years in, as I'm, you know, sometimes you outgrow the people that you've been with for a long 100%. time. Right. And yeah. that's what happened to me is, you know, I'm, I was literally like infatuated with hustle culture. I would sleep three, four, five hours. And then I would hustle for 15, 16, 17 hours a night, um, a day. And then like, I would have teams in Virginia and I lived in New Jersey and I would travel every weekend, five, six hours to help my team grow their businesses. And Paul had, had teams in Jamaica and he flew to Jamaica 15 times to help people build their businesses out there. Um, and so we hustle, we went to nine, 10 events every month, three, six, seven conferences every year. And we were hustling and bustling. And what happened was, is that I took a step back. I looked in the mirror and I'm 80 pounds overweight. Mm. My face is completely broken out. I have no money in the bank. I have nothing to show for what I have built in eight, nine years. And I realized that, oh my gosh, I'm literally hustling and killing myself to death, trying to fight and, and work towards this dream and this promise that will never happen. And that's when everything shifted for me. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Oh my gosh. I have so many questions, but I, I don't want to dive, you know, I don't want this to be the network marketing. Uh, I the network marketing uh, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I truly believe that network marketing is a breeding ground for psychopaths and narcissists. <laughs> it's we it's just set up too that. well it's for so people true. to control others. And yeah. it's so true. Because true. when you give fill somebody's void, you own them. Oh yeah. Because then for them to like remove that, they got to go figure it out. Right. Mm -hmm. People like to be told how to think what to do. Mm -hmm. Right. People want to be protected. Right. And it's like, you're in this tribe. So, yeah, I mean, this is where our stories are very similar um, and that I got in because I just, like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends. I just wanted good people that would accept me and love me for who I was. And that's how it got me. My, the person who really coached me in the beginning was a genuine, amazing human being, like a, this beautiful being of light uh, uh, who inspired me. And he lived such an awakened life that he, I was just like, at that time, I was so lost. And, you know, when they say like, uh, you know, your life is your message. Like Gandhi says that the way he lived just totally confused me because he was such a happy, loving person. And I wasn't. Um, right. That's what got me in and made me want to succeed. But then, of course, he was being controlled and manipulated in his own right. right. Um, and he married my psychopath mentor's uh, sister. Um, and it just created all this craziness. And he oh he God. had undiagnosed bipolar and was and they were you know pressuring him not to deal with it. And he just crashed yeah. and fell apart and ended up taking his life a few years later. Oh, yeah. And after he left again, I was like, that void that he was filling was gone. But now this is the only community I knew. Mm -hmm. And I told everybody I was going to be a millionaire. So now what am I supposed to do? Oh. Um, and so I was in for 13 years, more than Michelle. Um, and, you know, it's uh, it, it, a lot of it was ego based, though. I wanted to feel yeah, good. I'm an absolutely. entrepreneur. You know, Absolutely. I'm, I'm helping people and I, I truly did always want to help people. Right. Uh, and that's why I actually Amway launched in the country of Jamaica uh, in 2010. And as a college student, I flew down there, didn't know a person down there and built a huge business down there doing uh, 50,000 US a month in sales just in the island of Jamaica. We had to figure out how to do import export um, on top of like moving products where their income is much less than in America. Right. So it was a huge challenge. But man, I was really helping people. I would hand out these books and audio tapes to people as if it was food. Like if you're in Africa handing out starving people, sure. like line because nobody would ever give them a book about thinking positive. Opportunity, or, yeah. Uh, an audio about, you know, how to, you know, public speak or whatever it is. And so I always really help these people and we really did. And mm -hmm. I can't get into super depth because we, we don't have enough time for it. But uh, Amway is just the supplier. BWW is our training program. And that's the real culty aspect of it. Mm. The Jamaicans, they're very independent people who don't want to be controlled. And so they were not willing to submit to that part. So my mentors never helped me there. Mm -hmm. And so we bent, built genuine actual sales businesses in Jamaica. Um, but my mentors never gave a shit about it. 
because they couldn't control these people. Mm -hmm. So um, after I started, stopped putting effort, the whole thing fell apart. But we help people make a lot of money down there. Um, but then after that, I'm like, why am I still here? But then again, it's like, it's all I knew. All my friends right. were here. All our friends were there. My yeah. whole 20s, I'm here. It's like, what else am I supposed right. to do? But then as I started pursuing my happiness, taking care of my health, you know, moving out of my parents' house, finally getting a job, getting out of debt. I, I ran, I, I started running. I did a marathon. I overcame cancer. You know, they never cared about all this. Even when I had a tumor, one, one of my mentors never called me. And my mom kept saying, like, isn't that weird that she didn't call you? And uh, my mom was, and I defended her. I said, oh, no, she's just busy. Yeah. Uh, this woman, anytime I did something wrong, she'd be the first one to call me. The moment I'm not feeling well, nothing. And so but it takes a while to notice these things and realize yeah. these things. So uh, I really started to see it in 2018 when I did the New York City Marathon. In 2019, I went to Peru twice and did uh, 10 ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, in the Peruvian jungle. And that just blew my mind beyond anything I could possibly comprehend. Uh, and it changed my life. I set my sights on creating a remote job, traveling the world, you know, and then that's what's led us to where we are today. How many ayahuasca? Is that, <laughs> you say 10? Uh, 10, yeah. yeah. Wow. Ayahuasca is something that, uh, I, I haven't done myself. Um, I'm, I, I'm a big third eye open, you know, kind of guy. And, and I believe in the power of ayahuasca and psilocybin and, and all these different things that really kind of awaken this, you know, this sleepy thing that's inside of us and really kind of shows us another, another perspective that we probably typically can't, can't acquire on our own. So mm -hmm. that's fascinating, man. I'd love to talk to you more about that later on, but yeah, we are definitely, definitely going to have to have a part two of this podcast for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, okay. So, so now we, we are, we've got the network marketing down and yeah. we realize at this point that this, this isn't our bag. We got to get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and you courageously make the leap out of network marketing into real estate. I don't want to dig too much into, you know, how'd you find out about wholesaling and all this stuff. Um, but what are some of the skills that you learned from network marketing that have translated very well into real estate? Oh, that's well, a great question. And something to also add is it, it takes years to recover from being in a cult. Oh, yeah. So it took us years to really recover. We're from still this. recovering. You know? Yeah. <laughs> someone that's not in network marketing, never have been that you guys make it seem like the last thing I would ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I am anyone that tells me in network marketing, I'm running. See ya. <laughs> Good. Run it's like far. a horror film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Paul and I have gone through many therapy sessions. I mean, um, lots. I mean, that's what ayahuasca was for me. Yeah. And, and like so was. many other things that it's like, what is, who am I? What's my purpose now? What exactly. is my identity? Getting rid of all of our friends, all of our coaches. It's like a complete reset. Yeah, um, but, but I, it's also a beautiful experience because now our radar for narcissists, psychopaths, controlling environments is so high that like nobody fucks with us. <laughs> right. We I get it. Our distance. Yeah. And um, we have no problem keeping our distance. So that was the negative part of it. But there, you know, we that's always, the biggest benefit now. Yeah. The benefit. That's the benefit is like we can see through the bullshit now we can see through cults and all that. But another really amazing benefit that came from network marketing is that Paul and I are, are master networkers. Mm. So we can literally be in any room and network and connect with like the best people there mm -hmm. because we are really good at reading energy. We are really good at just being authentic. And, you know, based on the inner work that Paul and I have both done, we truly believe that we are magnets to the right people in our lives. Whereas when we were in network marketing, we were more like chasers. We were chasing after people. But, you know, after we killed the ego and uh, stepped into hu humility and really led in surrender, like living a life of a surrendered life, um, we were able to attract the right people and the right environments and the right opportunities to us by just kind of like letting go. Um, mm. so one of the, that's one of the biggest things that also helped us is we're really great networkers. The second thing is Paul and I led in network marketing, our egos led our life. And so one of the things that helped us when we left is that it helped us kill the ego and we shot it down. And I think that that's the reason why Paul and I have been so blessed is because we're not ego based leaders. We're not ego based people. We literally live in humility and surrendering. 
And that was another benefit that came from that. And then the third thing is obviously, um, you know, we know how to make money, right? We're very, we're, my mom calls me a money making machine. So we know how to create businesses. We know how to build teams. Obviously, right. we're very good at finding the right people. We know how to scale companies and, and make it into six figures within six months to a year. And we also are very, um, we know how to take steps into the right direction forward. It was the same thing in network marketing, right? Where you had, we in, in network marketing, we had four basic steps to get you to diamond right well for us we have basic steps that we take in our life to get us to our diamond where for us is like buying you know 20 30 40 acres of land building our dream home and building a beautiful family um and then have and be multi-billionaires by the time that we're 40 where we don't have to work and just focus on building beautiful children into this world that can do great mm -hmm. things that's our that's our diamond right so that is another beautiful benefit that we came that came from there and also we love people. We truly, Paul and I love human beings. I am constantly fascinated by the human race. And so that is one of the things that was not a benefit in network marketing because in network marketing, you have to love your ego. You have to love yourself and, you really do. and, and be, be fake. fake, you know? Um, and so Paul and I love people so much and we're the realest people you will ever get. Like if something is weird, some energy is off, I will be the first to be like, okay, what's going on? Something is like, <laughs> weird. Bring out the sage. Like, you know, so I am. Uh, so, so, true. so yeah. So that's one of the benefits is the, all, all those steps. And yeah. And yeah. That's why I'm rocking this hat, man. Cause we're Dude, I love that hat. <laughs> free. Uh, that's it. We're really free. Yeah. I mean, I'm just so grateful that we went through that experience and, um, uh, you know, we went through a lot of healing. Yeah. And um, after that, it's like we had to rebuild everything. And yeah. then as we were doing that, we realized, well, we got to find somewhere to find wealth and create wealth. Um, and that's how it eventually led to real estate. Um, you know, Michelle was bouncing around from different this business to that business to this business. And I'm, I was working remotely. Uh, and it wasn't until she discovered real estate that we said, wow, I think this is the way that we're going to do it which led us to Astro and Jamil and to where we are today. Oh my goodness. Like this, this, this honestly, I, I can't think of a better time to, you know, to say, let's talk about the, the real estate stuff on part two. I really want to, I, I, cause I want to dive deeper, you know yeah. what I mean? I don't want this to be yeah. a very long yeah, I'm intrigued. podcast, but yeah, I can't, I don't want to surface, you know, go over the real estate stuff because, you know, I, I don't, it just wouldn't yeah. do justice to do that in 10 minutes, but let me ask you guys. And you know, so you, you are clearly people who, for those of you who don't know, or who haven't met Paul Michelle or who don't follow them on Instagram, they're in a different country almost every other week, every, every week. These guys live the lifestyle. My IG is the lifestyle dude, just because I've always been in the lifestyle and yeah. seeing you guys actually accomplish what I want to do is uh, phenomenal. I mean, you guys just got back from Greece, you know, yeah. you just talked, you're going to Bali in a few yeah. months. You're in Arizona now. Um, yes. So you guys are clearly winning in the wholesale game. And I don't want to go over numbers or any of that stuff. We'll, we'll save all that for, for part two. But let me ask you guys, what's one of the most recent things you've done that's out of your comfort zone? Oh. What are you guys doing to challenge yourself? I think working with new people is a challenge. You use a challenge, yeah. Well, just it's it can be challenging because they just don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that's why we only work with people with like, like that have some type of experience, whether it's astro students have gone through the course and because we just don't have time to train people. And there's yeah. so much free game out there. Like, why are you going to come to us for training? Yeah. Come to us when you got it ready and we can bring you into a business that um that just for sure. Them. Michelle for sure. had a really clutch, uncomfortable meeting. Yeah. with her COO yesterday and her company, her team today, yeah. uh, because there were some things she needed to fix. So maybe that's it for you. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe on a trip that you guys have recently taken, was there a, an, an awkward situation where you were like, oh, I don't know if we should do this, but you did it and it ended <laughs> up being awesome. Yeah. I love hearing about these things. So what's something maybe that's not business related that you did. Oh, that was okay. I got heard of skydive three times. Okay. Skydiving, which is an amazing, okay. To get rid of your fears, go skydiving. <laughs> what he's really talking about is like comfort zone in terms of lifestyle. 
two things that has happened to us. And this is uh, one of my really great friends who I lived with her for three years. She messaged me and she was like, one of the, what are some of the biggest things that you learned this year? And I mm -hmm. said that abundance doesn't come to you. Like, you know, it, it doesn't really come to you unless you attract it, which is wonderful. That's one way of getting abundance. But the way that we've been able to receive abundance is literally by stepping into it. Like literally throwing ourselves like skydiving, getting throwing yourself off the plane and and landing in abundance. And there's two ways that we did that. The first one was when we went to the Maldives for my 30th birthday. It's two thousand dollars a night for those huts on the water. Ooh. OK. okay. Um, and so I told Paul, I said, uh, we're going to Maldives. We didn't have the money at that time. I mean, we kind of did. We had just did like a 70 K month, two months prior, but we were also living in Hawaii where it was like $10,000 for our Airbnb and then like $5,000 for food. And like, so, you know, we had expenses. So when March came around, we were like, we're going to the Maldives. I don't care how we do it. So we found this beautiful hut. We, we hired a travel planner who helped us with everything. And then it was $2,000 a night and um, the the hut hotel was like, okay, you put your credit card. We won't charge you until like five days before you get there. And I was like, well, I'm going to put my credit card in here. Okay. <laughs> well, we have about a couple weeks to figure out how we're going to pay for that. <laughs> and that's literally what we did. And uh, we stayed in the Maldives for three nights and we did many, many activities and that was the best trip we've ever taken. And ever since then, every trip that we've taken has been an abundant trip. For uh, our trip that we took from Greece to Turkey to Mexico was a $30,000 trip. Nice. And uh, one of the rooms that we stayed in was also like a $2,000 a night room. Yeah. And uh, we were only going to do it one night for our two year anniversary and that's it. But when we got there, they show us the room that we were supposed to stay on the last night. And it ended up being that they upgraded us for all three nights. Four nights. For all four nights for that $2,000 room. Wow. Free of charge. Dude, so, you awesome. know, because we do these uncomfortable things, we are able to really experience abundance and then get blessed in abundance because we have faith that, you know, you not know. only is the money going to come back, but we get to really become better people when we, um, really see the the beauty that life has to offer. Um, and so our 30K trip in Greece ended up being wonderful because then Paul closed a deal and made $30,000 while we were in Greece. Oh, and, oh you know, I love it. Yeah. It literally came Let's right go. Yep. You know, so <clears throat> money comes and goes. It ebbs and it flows, but time never comes back. And so these true. experiences are always going to be in our mind. Our Greece trip was the best trip we've ever taken outside of with Maldives. And, um, and we, now we know, like we see prices and instead of looking at price, we look at ROI now, Absolutely. you know, how many, how many points is it going to get us on our credit card so we can get free trips? You know, what's the content that we're going to be able to create to inspire someone else to come to Greece? You know, um, how are we going to bless the country of Greece? with our finances, you know, and this is how we see life because we were able to do uncomfortable things like that. How, how would you encourage someone to step into abundance in the real estate investment world or wholesaling? Oh, that's a good question. I think that it's much bigger than that. I think it's, it's going to come from within. It's not about real estate. It's like, if I'm not living and loving myself and from a place of abundance, then it will, it's going to, reflect in real estate so if mm -hmm. i'm coming from a place of lack mm -hmm. of desperation it's going to reflect in everything i do right right like if you see jameel he is the most loving giving happy joyful person everything he does yeah and that's how it reflects back to him I and see. so i think it really comes down to the core and the personal work i think a lot of people go into real estate think oh i'm going to make all this money just like we did when we went to network marketing right but the reality is no we actually needed to work on ourselves for 10 years all the network marketing was a lot of ignoring the issues. Um, <laughs> but I had to do like really a lot of intense work that ayahuasca and a lot of other things helped me with, you know, like learning to be accountable. Like if you can't be accountable, if I can't trust myself, if I can't follow through, right. If I don't know how to properly communicate with people, if I don't need to be know how to be professional, the number of people who message me and say, I'm a wholesaler or a buyer and their photo is them like, 
with a stack of cash. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. It's it, one of my first videos I ever did w was that, you know, it, literally after I joined or after I got into wholesaling, I mean, you can go back to my IG. One of the first videos I ever did was letting people know, Hey, represent yourself professionally. Cause I, oh. I would, you know, I would get friend requests from people at the time and it'd be, you know, a picture of them like, you know, on two oh, knees. Yeah. And I'm like, Stop doing this. So the sorry, worst one I, I is just when they don't have a picture of themselves. They just have a picture of like a flower, <laughs> <laughs> or it's just like the Eiffel Tower, and yeah. you're just like I, the ones with the cat, like yeah. the cat. The cat. Uh -uh. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But let's it's step like, it up. No, well, not. guys, look. Uh, we're definitely going to have to have you back for a part two. I, I, I now, you know, see and understand why people fall in love with you guys. It's so easy. You're, you guys are so likable. You're so genuine. You're so honest. Um, I cannot wait to, you know, to grow my friendship with you guys and, and meet you guys, you know, face to face. Yeah. Eventually, hopefully. Yeah, at this well, come in. Bro, come on up, man. It's, it's a little too cold out here now, but my car has been warming up. I was just telling them I gotta go get my kids. Um, <laughs> But nonetheless, guys, thank you. Thank you so, 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 so much for your thank time. You. And thank you for your doing. time. Thank you for Absolutely. having us. Absolutely. And for all the listeners and, and viewers, again, we're going to have them back and we're going to dive deeper into the, the, the next part of this. And so, um, but until then, you guys be safe and be well. And uh, we'll catch you next time on the, uh, on the Wholesale Elite Podcast, guys. Take care. Peace. What up, Elite fan? That's a wrap for today's episode. But look, if you got value out of the show today, do us a huge favor and give us a review or give us a like or subscribe. Do all the things to help us get the word out there. And look, we want to see you on the next show. So get out there and crush it, make it happen. Stay tuned for the next episode. Peace.